Hello, and welcome to the final lecture of this Introduction to Machine Learning course, Lecture 11. Today we continue talking about unsupervised learning, dimensionality reduction and data visualization. We started last time with principal component analysis and today we will talk about a method called TSNI and, and related methods. So just as a reminder, in this unsupervised learning setting we have some data matrix X uh, where samples are rows and features are columns. Uh, we're not trying to predict anything, so there's no Y matrix uh, that we would predict. Instead, we're trying to find some, some interesting structure in this data. So we imagine um, that each, each sample, each row of this matrix is a point in the high-dimensional space. And for the dimensionality reduction problem, what we want to do is we want to reduce the number of dimensions from this potentially high dimensional space to a low dimensional space. And today we're going to be talking about two dimensional data visualizations. So we will always reduce the dimensionality just down to two, which can be plotted as a scatter plot like that. This is also called embedding sometimes. So the task is to embed high dimensional points into two dimensions to preserve some interesting structure in this data. So for example, if the high dimensional data have three clusters, well separated clusters like here, then we would ideally want to see three well separated clusters on the embedding. And again, ideally, if there are some more complicated structures present in the high dimensional data, we would like to see these complicated structures uh, in the embedding as well. Not everything can be preserved, but we would like to preserve as much interesting structure as possible. So this is the, the task of, um, of TSNI and of today's lecture. Um, so let's talk briefly about what kinds of dimensionality reduction uh, there are, how we can classify uh, dimensionality reduction algorithms. So the first um, possible classification is that the algorithms can be unsupervised or supervised. So most of the time when we're talking about dimensionality reduction, we, talk, we, we, we operate in the unsupervised setting, for example, PCA from last week. But one can, in principle, consider supervised dimensionality reduction. For example, linear discriminant analysis that we discussed earlier in this course can be understood as finding linear projection that maximally separates classes, right? So this is, in some sense, dimensionality reduction that is that is guided by the by the class labels so this is a supervised uh, dimensionality reduction problem another possible uh, distinction is between linear and non-linear methods so principal component analysis PCA is a linear method because in the sense that we are projecting high dimensional data onto a, a, a subspace so projection is a linear operator as we discussed last time in principle one can imagine non-linear methods where the the mapping from the high dimensional to the low dimensional space would be nonlinear. Kernel PCA um, comes to mind. And finally, there are methods that don't construct any mapping from the high dimensional space to the low dimensional space. So imagine you have all these points in the high dimensions and you're trying to position the points in two dimensions such that some important structure in the high dimensions is preserved in this in this embedding. This is something that I will, will be calling non-parametric method because we, we never construct a function, explicit function that maps high dimensional to low dimensional space. Instead, we're just optimizing low dimensional positions of the points directly. In this sense, this is a non-parametric method. So I give here an example of multidimensional scaling, which I will introduce in a minute. TSNI is another example of that. Uh, but PCA, for example, is clearly a parametric method because there's a, that there's a function mapping high dimensional data to the low dimensional data. Um, just a note on terminology, often in, in the literature, these methods um, that I'm going to talk about today, such as TSNI, are called nonlinear dimensionality reduction. I find this a bit sloppy because there's no mapping, there's no, there's no function that can be linear or nonlinear at all. Um, so I don't, I'm not a fan of this term, but they are often called like that. And examples of these methods are multidimensional scaling, TSNI, UMAP, a more recent algorithm, and actually many, many others. And before we really start talking about, about the, the nuts and bolts of that, let's, let me just briefly show you where these things are used, why, why this is of use at all. And actually there are academic fields where this is, this ha these, these methods have been used a lot and are very popular. So here's one example. 
is single cell transcriptomics, or also called single cell RNA sequencing. So this is a biological technique that was developed and, and gained popularity just in the last several years, where samples of our data matrix, so our, our samples, are cells, single cells, and features, so the columns, are genes. So for example, in this case, from in, in, in this paper, um, 500,000 cells were profiled from, from, a, from a mouse nervous system, were profiled, and for each cell, there's information about how strongly each gene in the mouse genome, and there is 25,000 genes, let's say, in the mouse genome, how strongly each gene is expressed in each cell. Okay, that's the, that's the data. That's the input data to, for example, a visualization algorithm that can then produce a picture like that, where each point is a cell that are colored here depend, um, by, by some biological identity of these cells. And you see a lot of, a lot of potentially interesting structure shown by this T-SNP plot. Another example is population genetics, where samples would be people, in this case, and features are so-called SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms, which is something that tells you where, in which positions in the genome your, um, your genetic code is different from the average, genome, av average human genome. So again, every point in this visualization is a person, and then um, color, um, I think, codes here, ethnic uh, origin of the people from the UK. And again, this is something like half a million people depicted here. And again, one can see a lot of very meaningful structure um, appearing on this plot. So here's the, the reference to look it up if you want. Um, th my third example would be behavioral uh, physiology, where in this case, each dot is a syllable sung by um, a songbird, a zebrafish, I think. When they are trying to, when they are learning um, to sing a particular a particular song, and one can see how the syllables evolve during during training, and features are spectrogram bins corresponding to the syllables. And as a final example for something non-biological, this is this is an example taken from this great paper where there is 15 million books embedded in these two dimensions. So every point here is a book from a digital library. Um, Features are words, so there's uh, in fact millions of features here and millions of books. It's a very large and very sparse data matrix. Um, and you see clearly the books cluster by the language, of course, because the words are very different. But if you look within the English language books, you see that, they, that there is a very meaningful structure by, by the topic. And one can zoom in, for example, here the literature uh, part, uh, the fiction and um, see further structure down the road. So again, very complicated, very large data set with a lot of complex structure hidden in it, clearly in the relationship between, between the books. Um, and algorithms like TSNEO and, and related ones can, can make this beautiful but also useful visualization and, and un un uncover some, some data that may be hidden there. Okay, most of the time today, I'm going to be talking about MNIST data, which is a classic machine learning data set consisting of images, handwritten images of digits. Um, so there are labels, there's, there's 10 different digits possible here. There's 70,000 of them in, in the entire data. Each image is 28 by 28 pixels, so 784 pixels. So our pixels, the pixels are our features and 70,000 is the sample size. So we want to, to visualize this in two dimensions. The method that we already discussed is principal component analysis. So I can show you how the PCA of this data um, looks like. Here it is, right? Um, in fact, quite some interesting structure can be seen here already. So this is, for example, the digit one. Is, is seems to be all grouped out here. The zeros are here on the right. These three digits on top uh, overlap a lot, but if you look close at what digits they are, 7, 9, and 4, and if you think about pixel representation, then actually 7 and 9 and 4 overlap a lot in terms of having the same pixels. So it does make sense that they overlap here. Some of these digits are also similar in terms of how they are written. So we, we see we, PCA works. It, it shows us something that is meaningful, but 
perhaps one can do better in some sense. We clearly, if you didn't have labels, imagine that this is a black and white picture, you would actually have trouble, uh, or you, it would not be possible to look at this and say, ah, okay, there are 10, 10 different kinds of objects uh, present in this data set, right? It's, it's, it's all completely blurred together, with the exception of maybe this, this slightly denser cluster of ones um, on the left. Um, so I'm, I'm going to start presenting this, what I call non-parametric methods by multidimensional scaling, which is a very, a very old method from the middle 20th century, developed in the 50s and 60s by, by, by different people. Um, and the aim of MDS is to arrange points in, in two dimensions such that pairwise distances between points are preserved as well as possible. So this, this, this makes sense. Here's the loss function of MDS, or this seems to make sense. Here's the loss function of the MDS. These are our original pairwise distances. So we compute pairwise distance, Euclidean distance, for example, between every, every MNIST um, digit. And then we want to arrange points in two dimensions such that Euclidean distances in the embedding over here were as close as possible to original distance, and we just take the mean squared error as our loss. I can show you how the result looks like, and it's not it's not really better than PCA in this case, and it, it's, 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 it's not really impressive. Again, ones are close together here, and everything else is basically a mess. And another interesting or important point here is that I'm only showing 5,000 points here, whereas for PCA on the previous slide, that was all 70,000. And the reason I'm only showing 5,000 is that it, it, is, it is very... Um, challenging to produce a multidimensional scaling embedding of a larger sample size because to do that we need to compute pairwise distances between all pairs of points so this is quadratic complexity in terms of memory and and runtime probably as well so if you take 70000 images you need to compute distances 70 time 70000 times 70000 that's the size of the distance matrix and even to compute this and store in memory this distance matrix is already uh, prohibitive or at least requires um, requires a lot of memory and then that's before you even started optimization. So it's really hard to scale MDS, nobody uh, really uses MDS for larger data sets, but presumably if we could compute it on, um, on all 70,000 MNIST images we would see something similar, at least that is, that is my guess. So why does MDS not show us structure that I will later show you is actually present uh, in this data. Why does MDS fail in some sense, even though the loss function seems to be pretty reasonable? And, and it has an interesting and important reason why MDS fails in this case. It turns out that preserving high dimensional distances in the low dimensional embedding is just a bad idea. It sounds as a good idea, but it is a bad idea in fact because it is not possible to preserve these distances. There's no way to arrange points in 2D to preserve the distances. Um, and let me illustrate here by computing pairwise distances and, and plotting a distogram, histogram over pairwise distances in the high dimension, in high dimensional space for these 5,000 points uh, subset of the MNIST data. Um, it doesn't look, it doesn't look striking probably, well, some distribution, but note that zero is over here. There are no small distances. There are no two digits that are very, very, that, ha that the distance is very small between them in the high dimensions. Most of the distances are around 3,000 in whatever units this is, right? But the smallest are over here, and they maybe, uh, maybe go down to, to 1,000. And you can't put the points in 2D so that this, this, this is true. If you want to have some large distances here between this and this, um, you can do that, but there will be some points that are close together that will have distance of around zero. It's just not possible to, to put point otherwise. And let me illustrate this slide in a slightly different way. I'm just going to generate a random Gaussian data in two dimensions, so random uncorrelated Gaussian with unit variance, and compute pairwise distances between all points in this Gaussian. And that is the distribution of distances, pairwise distances that one gets in two dimensions. And this does make sense. So there are some distances that are very small, around zero, or well, there's some, some, uh, some average distance that one gets and it goes uh, maybe to five for the points on the different sides of this two-dimensional Gaussian. And let me now show you what happens in ten dimensions. 
Again, there is some average distance. The distances are larger. Just think about computing the distance now between 10 dimensional random vectors. But the, the, the key point, and the one that is very easy to understand, actually, if you think about how these distances are, is computed, is that there are no points that have very small distance. It would be very unlikely to generate a string of 10 random Gaussian numbers twice and then have very small distance between them. That just doesn't happen. So all these distances live here around centered at 10. Um, and this thing looks basically shifted to the right. And if I scale the dimensionality up to 500, then here we are. Now, if this, is the, if this were the pairwise distances in the original data, and you want to arrange them in 2D, somehow to preserve these distances. This is just not possible. You're trying to, to, to fit something that will look like a blue distribution to something that looks like a green distribution. This, of course, fails, and, and that's why MDS often, or usually, typically, does not produce um, an, an interesting or meaningful embedding. So the key idea of TSNI and, and methods that we can call neighbor embeddings is that we just give up on that entirely. We, we are not trying to preserve the distances anymore. That's not possible, so let's forget about it. We will try, we will aim to preserve the rank of the distance, though, or even more specifically, we're going to aim to preserve this, this very left part. We're going to find neighbors in the high dimensional data. So neighbors, these are the pairs of points that have small distance, so they live here on the left side of this green distribution. And those we want to make sure that are mapped here to this part, so they are neighbors in two dimensions as well. And the rest should be the rest, right? So we want to make sure that this left part of the distribution is mapped to the left part of this distribution. And that's what all these methods um, are doing. So that's the idea of what I'm calling neighbor embeddings. Um, following this paper, um, which was basically a landmark paper that um, that suggested this idea for the first time and really um, was a game changer, I think. Um, so they suggested something that they called stochastic neighbor embeddings, or SNE. Um, so it's very, very influential, important paper, beautiful paper. In fact, what is much more often cited, though, nowadays is the TSNI paper, um, also co-authored by, by Jeffrey Hinton, that came out later, a few years later, and suggested basically one relatively minor modification of the SNE idea. We'll discuss what it is a bit later, and that's the TSNE method. And you can see that it's cited a lot. And actually, interestingly, if you look at the citation count, it just keeps increasing. So more than half of these 20,000 citations came from the last two years. And the reason, I think, why this is happening is that more and more fields, for example, in biology, started to generate data that are very, very, uh, very good for very amenable to, to this kind of algorithm. So very rich data with, and very large data. And, and people in these fields just like uh, using this algorithm, uh, this, this kind of algorithms, and that's why it just keeps gaining popularity more and more. And, and back then, 10 years ago, when, when it came out, um, it didn't seem as useful at the time. All right, so let me just show immediately how the TSNI of MNIST looks like. So this is the, the default TSNI um, picture of the MNIST, and it's beautiful. You see that every digit is actually its own island, right? There's almost no overlap between different digits. There's white space in between digits, so we see that there are 10 clusters in the data. Um, yeah, just great. How does it work? So the idea of the stochastic neighbor embedding, SNE and TSNE, is that the, so we want to preserve neighbors, right? And the loss function is the so-called kalblik leibler divergence between something that we will call pairwise similarities or affinities in the high dimensional and low dimensional space. So similarity is like the opposite of distance. Similarity is large when the distance is small. And the affinity, if the same for the affinity. We will say that two points that are very close to each other, they have small distance, they have large affinity. The points that are far away, they will have zero or near zero affinity or similarity. So we will define these affinities between all pairs, um, and we will make sure that they sum to one. Okay? High dimensional similarities will be called Ps, and low dimensional similarities will be called 
queues. And once it's done, the loss function is this thing here, which is known as the KL divergence. So you can see that if all P's are equal to all Q's, then this is zero. Uh, so that's what the algorithm tries to achieve. Um, yes, on this illustration, right, so I, I, I found some neighbors of this point I here and some close neighbors. So these will be pairs that have high affinity. And the affinity of this point I to something over here will be either will be very small, it will be near zero, or we can even set it to exactly zero to simplify things. Uh, so only these things have, have non-zero or at least um, substantially non-zero p-values. And if we look at this loss, uh, so it's not symmetric here, p and q uh, do not enter symmetrically, but we immediately see that we will pay high price in terms of this loss function if we take two close neighbors in the high dimensional space and put them far away. So two close neighbors, some of these pairs, they will have a large p-value, right? So this, is, this, this logarithm term will enter with this large weight in the loss function. And if q is, is small, then that's the price you're paying. What happens with the points that are far away to begin with? Well, they don't even enter explicitly this function, right? Because p term for them is nearly zero. So you pay high price for putting close neighbors far away. You do pay, a it, it's not correct to say that you don't pay any price uh, the other way around for putting points that were far away close to together. And how to see it here is that Q is normalized to sum to one, as I mentioned. So if you take points that were far away and put them close together, they will get a high Q value. So you will spend some of this, some of this Q weight that you have, because it has to sum to one, on this modeling the useless pair that, that doesn't enter this loss function. Okay, so normalization of Qs is actually the part, as we will also see later, is the part that makes TSNE want to keep far away points far away. Okay, so that we, we have the loss. What I need to tell you is how to define P and how to define Q. And then I need to tell you how to minimize this thing. So let's go over it. We'll start with high dimensional similarities, the p-values. And what TSNE does is that it essentially just computes the, the, the Gaussian um, kernel here. It, puts the, it takes the distance in the high dimensional space. In this case, it's Euclidean distance, but it could be any other distance, in fact. But we will, we will just talk about Euclidean distance today. So this is the distance between high dimensional points and then its exponent uh, with a minus sign of that, so a Gaussian, a Gaussian kernel. The, f the larger the distance, the, the smaller the p i j. So this is uh, what one can call it a directional uh, affinity. So p j i is not equal to p i j over here. And notice that the in denominator, we're just normalizing everything so that this thing sums to one. Okay, the larger the distance, the smaller the affinity, and they sum to one per point. And there is the sigma i squared term here. So this is a variance of this Gaussian kernel, the standard deviation. And the width of the kernel is chosen adaptively to, uh, to achieve the so-called, uh, to achieve this, the, the desired value of the so-called perplexity. And I don't want to spend too much time explaining that. You will see in a moment why. Uh, think about perplexity as the effective number of neighbors. So if we are in a very, uh, in a very dense part of the high dimensional space, then the sigma will be small so that this Gaussian kernel covers approximately 30 neighbors. Okay? This ga high dimensional Gaussian kernel, if it ba covers around 30 neighbors, uh, then the perplexity is around 30. If you're in a non-dense, in, in a very sparse region, then it will be a, a fat Gaussian so that it, again, covers approximately uh, 30 neighbors. So we just want that, we want to choose this adaptively, the width of the kernel, so that around 30 values are large and everything else should be much smaller. Okay, that's the intuition here. And that's not symmetric, so we'll just symmetrize that and then divide by n so that the entire Pij matrix sums to 1. So it's symmetric by construction. It sums to 1 by construction. Every point has around 30 large affinities where the perplexity parameter regulates this value. And if you're a little bit confused by that, that's OK. But I'm going to show you later that actually uh, 
this isn't very important. One can, one can define uniform similarities, which are much, much simpler. We'll just say, we'll just take 30 nearest neighbor for each point. For each point, we take 30 nearest neighbors and say that the affinity to all these 30 nearest neighbors is exactly the same, one over 30, and it's zero everywhere else. Okay, so this is something I will call uniform similarities. So I'm replacing these two lines by this very simple definition, and I will later show that in most cases it just produces the same or very, very similar result. Um, so here all affinities are the same. Here they are not exactly the same. The closest point has a, large, a bit larger affinity. The points further away have a bit smaller affinity. The important is that once you go beyond 100 neighbors or so, everything is zero. All right, that's how we define high dimensional similarities. Now the low dimensional similarities are defined similarly. So we compute the distance in the two dimensional embedding, that's my y's. I put the distance through the kernel, uh, which I will show in a second, and that's my q values, divided by this normalization factor that just sum over the entire pairwise, uh, over the entire data set, so all pairwise distances here. So this sums to one by construction. This is symmetric by construction. We just need to choose this kernel, and the original paper, the SNE paper, used the Gaussian kernel here as well. Okay, so that's, that now concludes the setting up the SNE loss function. Tisney made one change. It suggested to use a t-distribution kernel. Uh, in this case, it's also Cauchy kernel uh, instead. So instead of this function, TSNE uses that function. That's the only difference between SNE and TSNE. Uh, 1 over 1 plus distance squared. So this thing decays exponentially. This thing de decays as 1 over d squared. So it's called um, heavy tails. Okay? If you plot this Gaussian kernel and the t-distribution kernel, the t-distribution kernel has heavier tails. We'll get back to what it means, or no, what it uh, makes to the embedding in a few slides, okay? What we need to discuss first is how do we optimize that. So now we have p's, q's, we have k-o divergence between p's and q's as a loss function. How do we optimize that? Turns out one can just use good old gradient descent, and it works. So the loss is optimized via gradient descent. For example, one can start with a random configuration of points. We will talk about initialization a bit later and then just run gradient descent, and that's the final embedding that you will get. So let's try to work out quickly how the gradient works here. So the loss is p is the sum of p of logarithm of p over q. So it's actually two terms, p log p. That's a constant. We, we're not optimizing over it, so I, I will remove it. I, I'm not even showing it here. What is left is minus p logarithm q. Okay, now remember that the q was defined as this w, which is the kernel of the, um, of the distance in low dimensions divided by normalization factor, so I'll write it like that here, and decompose in two terms. Remember here that the sum of p over all pairs is 1, which is why I can write the second term like that. And now if we look closely at these two terms, we can see that the first term can be interpreted or, or it will generate attractive force between two points in the embedding um, that were neighbors originally. And the second term will generate repulsive forces. So to see that actually one, can one doesn't even need to compute the derivative, right? That's not gradient yet. That's just rewriting the loss function. So if we look at that, this has to be small, so wherever p is non-zero, this has to be small, so w has to be small, which means the distance, um, sorry, th there is a minus sign. w has to be large, so the distance has to be small. So wherever two points were neighbors, the distance should be as small as possible in the, in the embedding. So this, will, this term will try to pull neighbors together. Okay, that's what we want. What does this term do? Again, we want to minimize that, and now there's a plus in front of it. So we want to minimize every, every W, which means that the points will feel repulsive forces. And that's the balance here. So one can, I will show you TSNE optimization in a second, 
And it basically works as a kind of physical many-body simulation. The points are flying around in two dimensions. The neighboring points feel attraction and want to get close. But there's also a repulsive force between all pairs of points that, come, comes, that originates from this normalization term. And there's this balance between attraction and repulsion. And in the end, we get some embedding. So we can, to compute the gradient, we actually need to take the derivative. And if one takes the derivative of this, then indeed, this term ends up giving you uh, attractive forces, and, and, and this term ends up giving you uh, repulsive forces. And then on each iteration, you compute these forces for every point, and make a little step in the direction of this gradient, which just means you move all the points. Then you recompute the gradient, and so on. So that's roughly uh, how the optimization for this, for any method. Actually, for multidimensional scaling, it works similarly. Um, and for, for TSNI, it, it, it also works out like that. So think about this interaction of points as an intuitive picture um, behind the optimization. And now I can show you the gradient descent optimization of the MNIS data. I will let it play a few times. Um, and notice that we're starting here with random initialization, that, that's the Gaussian blob in the beginning. And then the point starts moving, and relatively quickly they form the, they form these islands of the same color, which is the same digit, and then slower, you see that it gets like progressively better. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know this 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 salmon colored cluster, for example. You can watch that; like it slowly gets together, um, and this um, violet cluster also gets together, and so on. The end result here is, though, not as good as I showed before, right? Why is it not as good as I showed before? So I'm not doing, I, I, I modified the, it a little bit uh, to show you that, um, or just to, to, to say it better, I, I, I did not employ one trick that is usually employed. I will tell you about the trick in a second. But let's, I, I think it's very important to see here and understand why this happens. So these blue points and these blue points feel attraction. Some of them are neighbors, they want to get together. But there's all this stuff in between, and they feel repulsion from that. So these two groups of points, they feel attraction, they want to get closer, but they can't, they cannot, because of this stuff in between. So in the end, you converge to something which is a local minimum. Moving them closer would decrease the loss function. Moving this entire island over there would actually would actually be a better solution, but that's not, you can't get from there, from here. So you're stuck in a bad local minimum here. And it happens because the repulsion is too strong in a way. It does not allow these things to get together even though they want to. That's the intuitive, intuitive picture of that. So how can we fix that? And in fact, already the original papers um, suggested a very useful trick how to, how to do it better. And the trick is, well, they, can't, they want to get together, but they can't get together, right, these things. So let's increase all attractive forces temporarily, and hopefully this will let them go through these old clusters in between and, and, and connect. And then we'll decrease it again. So this is a trick called early exaggeration, and I'm showing the animation of Amnist using early exaggeration. And now, you see, it's, it's, it's much better. Now everything is very neatly separated. And importantly, I started from the same random initialization as on the previous slide. Okay? And, and here it works because until now, look, here, now. Now the early exaggeration was turned off. And until it was turned off, it, the attraction was so strong that every, every digit, so every cluster, could uh, collect together right here. And it's actually inter interesting embedding in its own right. We'll get back to it a bit later. Then we turn the early exaggeration off, and that's the moment where every cluster expands a bit, because now repulsion uh, attraction is weaker, repulsion is stronger, and you get the final TSNI result. It's important that the learning rate is, f is large enough so that there's enough time in these early iterations, 250 gradient descent iterations uh, by default, um, um, for early exaggeration to work. Um, but there is a good heuristic um, for the learning rate actually suggested recently um, that does the trick. Okay, so one final but a very important remark here or a topic is that, well, if we want to scale TSNI up for even for MNIST, 70,000 points, but maybe beyond for 700,000 point, 700, points, 7 million points, 
then we need to somehow, we need to think, we need to, to speed it up because naively you compute the pairwise distances between all points in high dimensions, in low dimensions, that's n squared memory and n squared complexity because on each gradient descent iteration you need to take care of all pairwise forces. There is attraction, there's also repulsion between all pairs of points. So that's clearly, this is not going to work. So in order to use it, and I already used it in these uh, amnest uh, animations, we need to s do something with attractive forces and with repulsive forces to make it uh, feasible. So let's discuss them separately. Attractive forces first. So attractive forces, th that's the easier part. Only small, uh, I already s told you, only a small number of similarities will be, will be not will be large. Most similarities, even if you compute the entire distance matrix, all n squared values, um, and then put them through the Gaussian kernel, most of them will be around zero. So we can say we're not going to compute these near zero values. We will just, for each point, find its nearest neighbors, a small set of nearest neighbors, that's called constructing a k nearest neighbor, k n n graph of the data. So it's a graph where every point, is, every sample is a point, and if a point is a nearest neighbor among the nearest neighbors of some other point, then there's an edge between them. That's a graph. Um, so for example, if you want to use perplexity 30, which is the, the standard default choice for TSNI, then we can take 90, three times larger, K for the KNN graph, find 90 neighbors of each point and compute this, this uh, Gaussian similarity between them. And by the time you got to 90th nearest neighbor, the PIJ is basically zero, and for everything else we'll just say it's exactly zero. This makes it a lot faster, the optimization, because you don't need to, you don't, now you don't have n squared attractive forces, you have n times 90 attractive forces, roughly. Um, but even a larger gain you get, or maybe another, just an, I'm not sure what's larger, but another very large gain you can get if you use something called approximate Canaan graph. So it turns out, and this is something I don't have time to cover today, that there are algorithms, even different approaches to com constructing Canaan graph approximately. Approximate Canaan graph means you construct a Canaan graph, but there can be errors. So maybe you find 90 neighbors for each point, but um, actually only A5 are really among the 90 nearest neighbors and five points that you found as nearest neighbors are not really nearest neighbors. Um, but it works well enough so that it doesn't make any difference for TSNU, for example, and it still works exactly as well. So these algorithms are, are great, work pretty good, and they're much, much faster than finding the exact Kanan graph. So that allows us to deal with the attractive forces effectively. For repulsive forces, um, that's a whole large topic that I don't have time to discuss in detail, but there is different approaches were suggested over the years of how to approximately compute these repulsive forces between all points. So instead of computing exactly all n squared repulsive forces, we're computing them approximately. So there are different ways to do that um, with recent ones having actually linear complexity. I don't have time to explain what this does. I will very briefly explain you what Barnes Hart does, even though you shouldn't use Barnes Hart anymore now because there are methods that are much faster. But it's slightly easier to explain, so I will, uh, on this slide, uh, try to give you just the gist of what's happening here. So imagine uh, these are your points, and I, I should say that the technique, this Barnes Hart method, was developed in physics, in computational physics, to solve the problems of, of many body simulations. And can be just used here. So you have points arranged like that. You construct this partitioning of the space so that the dense regions are partitioned finer and the sparse regions are partitioned um, coarser, so to say. And then if you need to compute, so after this is constructed, if you need to compute the sum of the repulsive forces that this point, for example, feels, so for, it, it's pointing down here, uh, let's say, we can instead of computing the sum over all these points, we can coarse grain it and say for these, for these uh, all points over here, the repulsion that this point feels is roughly the repulsion that it would feel if it were one heavy point. 
Okay, so we're computing just one term over here, uh, but the closer you get to this point, the the more fine grained um, you um, you you group uh, these points. So this allows this can be effectively implemented uh, efficiently. Sorry, implemented and can work pretty fast, and allows one to actually embed things like MNIST. Um, even though, as I said, um, there are even faster approximations. But that's the general idea. You somehow approximate the sum of the repulsive forces that each point is feeling. Okay, great. So with this, I'm done with the technical part. I explained you how to optimize the loss function, explained you the loss function itself, and now let's discuss various parameters that are in TSNI and what they do with the embeddings. So m I think traditionally most people think that perplexity is basically the parameter um, that one can adjust in TSNI. Um, so again, that's the essentially the K regulates the K in the K9 graph. Uh, so how many neighbors each point is feeling attraction to. And this is again the same image of MNIST with perplexity 30. So let me just show you what happens with much lower perplexity and much higher perplexity. Um, and what happens is that there's less attractive forces around here, so this thing like inflates more and um, it looks a bit like soap bubbles, I think. Uh, and here you have more attractive forces between more distance points, so what happens is that larger uh, clusters, so to say, collect uh, closer together in the embedding. But the thing is that very small values are rarely useful. Actually, they are usually it looks like that, and it's not very useful. So to, to, to use a perplexity that is much smaller than 30 in order of magnitude is, is almost never uh, useful. And to use a perplexity that is much larger than 30 is almost always impractical or even completely prohibitive computationally, because the larger the number of neighbors that you want to keep track of, the, the more attractive forces you have to deal with. So if you have a m data set of million points and you want a perplexity of 100,000, this will just not work. This will not fit the memory and you will never, it will never converge. So if you have a large enough data set, then you basically stuck with using perplexity of 30 or 50 or 100, but this doesn't make any difference for a large data set, but you cannot increase it enough. Uh, to, 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 to start seeing something qualitatively different. So, in fact, in most practical cases, perplexity is not a parameter that you can meaningfully vary, at least in my experience. Um, ah, that's one thing that I promised to show you uh, about the affinities. So this is, the, again, the default TSNI with perplexity 30, and this TSNI I made with uniform affinity in the high-dimensional space with 15 neighbors, um, so each point, for each point, I find 15 nearest neighbors, and it has the same affinity values to all 15, okay? And you have to look very, very closely to spot any difference here, uh, and even to make sure that I didn't, by mistake, um, I'm not showing you the same picture twice, but look, for example, this yellow cluster looks a little bit different, so it is not the same picture, but it's very similar. And you can take perplexity 300 and the uniform similarities with K150, and they will again look very similar. So it's, it, it doesn't have to hold mathematically, but in practice for most data set, it, it, it holds very well. So these entire Gaussian affinities in the high dimensional space, this is actually not important. You can just take uniform affinities with um, 15 nearest neighbors, and, and the rest just works the same way. OK. Um, Another important thing is what happens in, in low dimensional embedding with the similarity kernel. I mentioned before that SNE original paper used Gaussian kernel and a TSNE used Cauchy kernel. Um, and um, the TSNE paper made a big deal out of that. They said that they are addressing something they call crowding problem of uh, SNE by replacing this kernel. And the intuition that they, that they present in the 2008 paper is that sometimes you, the embedding, want, like the TSNI loss function, wants to preserve, for example, I don't know, uh, 50 nearest neighbors uh, of a particular point, but there is not enough space, so to say, in a two-dimensional space 
to, to keep all these points close. So you have to make some sacrifice and put some of the nearest neighbors a bit further away. And if the kernel is Gaussian, then you will pay a high price for that. So the, the argument is let's take a kernel that decays slower, so a heavier tailed kernel than Gaussian, and then maybe the, some of the nearest neighbors can be allowed to move a little bit further away, but the Q value will still not, it will not go down by that a lot. Okay, so the heavy tailed kernel is more permissive, so to say, um, in a sense, and so the crowding problem is, is addressed or solved. So the funny thing is that the original paper doesn't actually show, for example, the SNE of the entire amnist, and it wasn't until, until recently that, that we implemented that um, in modern TC implementation to see what happens, and here's what happens. So this is the SNE result on the entire amnist, and this is the TSNE result, the Gaussian kernel, Cauchy kernel. So what you see here is the crowding problem. And in a sense, yeah, there is, there's some overlap between clusters, and there's very little or no white space in between the different clusters, and that's something you, you get with TSNE. Funny thing, or interesting thing, is that one can think of that as, as, a, as a family of kernels, where this is a t-distribution with infinite degree of freedom, if you, if you know that from your statistic classes, and this is a t-distribution with one degree of freedom, and one can vary the shape of this kernel, making it more or less heavier tailed, and see what happens with embedding. So here you move, like imagine moving from this embedding here, but one can make it even more heavier tailed. And if you do that, you get a picture like that. So this is using even heavier tailed kernel than the Cauchy kernel. And an interesting thing happens in that the each digit split splits into more fine clusters. So you'll see finer cluster structure. And the interesting thing is that you can, if you if you look at what images form this cluster, then you see that at least in some cases that's that's meaningful islands. So for example, the four can be written uh, like that, open on top, or it can be written as as it's printed over here, when it looks like that, okay? And some people write for open on top, and some people write for closed on top, and you see that one of these islands corresponds to one of these handwritings, and the other islands correspond to other kind of handwritings. Um, so you can, you, one can actually show that at least some of these islands are meaningful, and one can show the same on other data sets, so that's something I find even more remarkable. So here's, for example, analysis um, of, the, of that, the same library data set that I mentioned in the beginning, but a subset of it of Russian language. So there's half a million, 400,000 points over here, colored by the, by the year when the book was printed, the Russian language change changed uh, um, orthography in after the revolution. That's why all pre-1917 books are there and later books are over here. But the interesting thing is that you decrease the, this parameter, the, 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 you, increase, you make the kernel more heavy-tailed. Over here, you get all these islands. Are they meaningful or are they not meaningful? Well, we can find, for example, all the poetry books, and it turns out that the poetry books are all over here. So this island is the poetry island. It makes a lot of sense. Here, all the poetry books are also together. So TSNE does, like a default TSNE does group them all together, but it doesn't separate them from the rest visually. And all the math books that you can also just find by keywords are concentrated in this island. So this is the math island. And here, all these books are in this corner, but if you didn't know that these are math books, you would not suspect that this is something separate. So what happens here is the heavier tailed kernel emphasizes this fine cluster structure. Um, something else. I said before that TSNE preserves, like exp the loss function of TSNE explicitly is constructed to preserve local structure of the data. If points are neighbors, like nearest neighbors, then they, TSNE tries to keep them as nearest neighbors in the embedding. At the same time, TSNE will often struggle to preserve global structure of the data. Another way to formulate that is you, you, you do the gradient descent, you start from some initialization, but actually the loss function has many local minima, and sometimes they are bad local minima. I mentioned this before, remember, the first time I showed the MNIST animation, it was stuck in a local minimum. 
we could solve that one uh, by early exaggeration trick. Um, but in some cases, the initialization will play a large role as well. And to show that, I can use this very, very simple toy data set where the data is just two-dimensional circle with some noise added. And then if we, if we run TSNI on this data, so we're taking two-dimensional data and embedding it in two dimensions. Of course, this doesn't make a lot of sense, but just for the sake of this toy example, I can do that. So here's the default TSNI with random initialization on this data. It's actually um, a nice picture, I think. It looks like a knot, but... Um, Clearly, the, the, the global structure is, is messed up here. If you use PCA, the first two principal components of the data, to initialize TSNI, in this case, PCA just coincides with the entire data, of course, then you'll, it will converge to something like that. So these are two end embeddings that the gradient descent converge to. So this is a local minimum of the loss function, and this also is a local minimum of the loss function. But that's a bad local minimum. That's a better local minimum, and I think the um, uh, take-home message here is that it absolutely does make sense to use informative initialization, for example PCA, there are other choices, but for example PCA, to, to initialize the, the embedding, okay, because, because why not? Then you, um, you will converge to a better local minimum. That's true not only for TSNI, but for any kind of neighbor embedding algorithm. And, um, ah, yes, I have an animation that shows actually what happens if you, if you optimize this circle data with um, six different random initializations. Um, I think it's fun to watch because you can see very slowly how during the early exaggeration phase they are very slowly unwrapping. That's an interesting phenomenon, but very, very slowly. And then once the early exaggeration is turned off, it will happen in a second, you will see that, yeah, they stop unwrapping and, 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 and they make gaps, the overlapping, um, overlapping parts make a gaps because there's this repulsion that they feel. And in the end, you get this uh, six random knots. So interesting thing happens during early exaggeration where this is slow unwrapping because actually one can show that there is a mathematical relationship between strong early exaggeration and technique called Laplacian eigenmaps, which I don't have time to introduce properly today. Uh, but that explains why it slowly unwraps. Uh, but takes a long time to to unwrap fully, so in this case you you end up with the, with the knots like that. Um, and this doesn't only happen in this funny two-dimensional toy example, but let me show a real-world application where the same thing happens. So this is uh, a single-cell transcriptomic data set where there's a lot of different clusters. Um, that's the the paper I take the data set from, but even though there's a lot and a lot and a lot of different clusters, there are three very broad groups that you see here. And in fact, these are inhibitory neurons, these are excitatory neurons, and these are non-neural cells in the mouse cortex. But it doesn't matter for now. What matters is that if you do PCA of the data, you immediately see that there are three very distinct groups, right? But if you do TSNI, you see that maybe there's hundreds of, of, of small islands in the data, clusters in the data, but all these cells, for example, the gray-brown cells, they form a bunch of different clusters, and these clusters end up in different parts of the, of the data. So I, I am using early exaggeration and everything else as I should be doing here, and still it ends up like that. And that's because of the random initialization. If I rerun with a different random initialization, all these I will see the same islands, but positioned differently. So what one can do, as I already suggested, Let's just initialize TSNI with PCA, because why not? Then there is this global structure already in the data in the initialization, and then we'll converge to whatever it converges. Let me show what happens. You start with PCA. Here's early exaggeration phase. Now it, it's over, and that's the normal TSNI optimization phase. And here are all non-neural cells. They started in this corner in the initialization, and they, of course, end up in this part of the embedding together and all the excitatory cells will be on the right and they will, they will still occupy the right part, like the bottom right part of this embedding in the end. So um, again, general recommendation, always use informative initialization. In fact, modern TCN implementations do that by default.
Um, the last part that I want to cover today is to discuss the, the effect of uh, exaggeration. So I mentioned before that early exaggeration means multiplying attractive forces by some factor during the early iterations, very useful trick. Um, to achieve to, to get a better better convergence, but what if we kept the exaggeration throughout the optimization? What if we don't switch it off in the end? And what if we don't use 12 but different values and see what happens? Maybe you already noticed on the previous in in my animations that this early exaggeration phase actually produces some interesting embeddings, and then I always switched early exaggeration off, and in the end that's the Tissney result. But maybe we can study what one gets with different exaggeration values. And indeed, it turns out that one gets a very interesting family um, of embeddings. So let's discuss that briefly. So this, again, is a Tisney, default Tisney without any exaggeration. No, in the end, I turn early exaggeration off, and I'm left with this embedding. Now imagine that I'm running early exaggeration, and then after it's done, I keep on exaggeration of 4 until the end. I will end with this embedding over here. And if I use exaggeration 30 throughout, I will, I will get this embedding on the left. So that's the, that's the spectrum of embeddings here. There's more attractive forces on the left. Attractive forces are stronger on this side, and the attractive forces are weaker, so the repulsion is stronger on the right side. That's why I call it attraction-repulsion balance. Um, and it turns out that one gets very interesting embeddings along the way. For example, let's look here. Why first, first feature is that there's a lot of white space, which can be uh, useful to have or, I don't know, pleasing aesthetically or it emphasizes that these are different, different clusters. Um, another interesting feature of this embedding is that, for example, these three clusters are, are together and these three as well. So if we look at what these three clusters are, then we see that this is 8, 5, and 3, which overlap in the pixel space. And the same is true for 7, 9, and 4 over here. So we get larger cluster separation, but at the same time, we see like a larger groups of clusters that are um, connected by these nearest neighbor edges. They actually attract together stronger collect in this in this uh, larger groups and this makes a lot of sense we increased the attraction here right so everything becomes denser points get closer to each other these two uh, digits they feel also increased attraction so they basically glue together like that um, okay and for and the rest somehow balances out with uh, repulsion but if we increase increase the attractive forces even more, then all of them, all digits, will feel s at least some attraction and, and will glue together in something that looks like that and does not have, uh, does not have white space in between anymore. So we analyzed a bunch of different data sets, which you can look in this preprint from last year, and showed that this always happens and you always get more, so we interpret this as having more continuous structures here on the left and more discrete structures emphasized here on the right. You don't have a lot of continuous structures in the MNIST data, so I will show on the next slide another data set where this is clearer, but already in MNIST it's clear that we're getting at least more like a larger scale structures emphasized here when we, when we increase the attraction. Whereas you can say that this emphasizes some very local structure more precisely. For example, the threes seem to split a little bit in the three group in, in two different groups in this embedding here, and this is something that is completely lost over here because attraction is stronger. So one point is here that actually this is an interesting hyperparameter. At least empirically, it produces uh, it produces um, useful embeddings often, but. Its separate point is that it turns out, surprisingly maybe, that many or several other algorithms that were more recently developed in the last several years, they produced embeddings that are very similar to somewhere on the spectrum. So UMAP, for example, is a, is a method very related to TSNI, but it works very differently, it, it involves um, some stochastic optimization and so on. I'm not going to present it in detail to explain how it works. It 
appeared a few years ago and became very popular in some in some fields. For example, in single cell community uses UMAP a lot now. But so it works differently, but once you run it and you look at the embedding, it turns out that it looks UMAP of MNIS looks almost identical to this picture. That's basically UMAP of MNIS, give or take. And this happens not only for MNIST, but across the range of very different data sets. And one can analyze it mathematically, the loss function of UMAP, and show that actually it does uh, look very similar to TSNI, but att attraction is stronger. And this is true not only for UMAP, but for several other methods, we see that actually they produce outcomes that are somewhere on the spectrum, always to the left of TSNI, um, for the methods I know. Um, some correspond to exaggeration 4, maybe some other methods correspond to exaggeration 30, um, but they live on the spectrum. So that's pretty interesting. Even though the methods may be pretty different, but in the end, that's the, that's the meaningful family of embeddings that one, that one seems to be getting here with different algorithms. And here's my last example for today. This is a very large single cell transcriptomic study with two million cells. Cells come from mouse embryos during development. Um, so that's the original citation and we use this data set um, in that paper uh, to, to play around with for, for TSNI. And here I'm showing you the, the TSNI plot that is actually taken from the original paper. So original authors did TSNI, that's their TSNI. They also clustered the data in, in a bunch of different clusters and that's the colors that I'm, that I'm um, showing here. If one does the TSNI using high enough learning rate and the PCA initialization, so high enough learning rate, as I briefly mentioned before, is needed for the early exaggeration to work properly, um, then one gets a picture like that. And if you look closer, closely at this, you will see that this is a much better result than on the left. For example, there is this pink cluster over here, um, number 15, I think, which is here split in three parts, one, two, and three. They belong to the same cluster, but they appear three different parts here. Um, this doesn't make sense, and that's the, the bad local minimum. The, the, this could not, the early exaggeration was not strong enough, or the learning rate during this phase was not strong enough for um, for this to collect together. So if we set the hyperparameters right, then we get this result, which is much better. But that's not the, the most interesting part here. The most interesting part, I think, is what happens if you increase the exaggeration here, like the final, not the early exaggeration, but the exaggeration overall. And then we get this thing. So if this is, let's say, the default TSNI with no exaggeration in the end, but the hyperparameters, the optimization parameters set correctly. And this is what you get if you use exaggeration 4. And incidentally, if you use UMAP for this data, you will get a very similar result uh, to that. So, and what happens here is that there are larger structures here appearing. So here, if you look at this, you have no idea that there is maybe two very large continents in this data, whereas it's super apparent on the, uh, in here. And if we look at this, this slightly larger continent, then these are actually cells that correspond to neural development in the mouse embryo. And moreover, if one, if I if I show you the the labels for all clusters that that have something to do with neurons, you will see that there is a progression from a very early um, so-called glial cells that then give rise to neural progenitors, then then later develop into mature neurons. So you can see that there is a neural development from the bottom up here to the top, and that's just the progression. Of the, of the cells during the, during the mouse embryogenesis. So that's pretty cool that we see this one-dimensional time axis, essentially, in this embedding. And the interesting thing is that you cannot see it here. If you know where to look, then you can see that, in fact, this progression starts somewhere here and then goes like that to this orange cluster and on top here. So this is this neural um, this is this time axis of neural development, but if you don't know that, you will never see this here. On the other hand, some things can be seen on the right that cannot be seen on the left. For example, there are all these small islands here, which I don't know if they are biologically meaningful or not, but they, the data 
suggest that there are some small fine clusters in the data that one sees in, in, in the actual default TSNE over here. But here, with increased attraction, this is just gets collapsed together. So you don't see finer clusters anymore, but you see actually larger scale structures that is interesting. And, and in this case, we know from biological uh, knowledge that, a priori knowledge, that there should be this continuous uh, sub-manifold in the original data. So I think the, the way to think about that is the continuity discreteness trade-off that one gets with higher attraction, you emphasize continuous, uh, continuous sub-manifolds. With higher repulsion, you get more cluster structure uh, emphasized. And I'm going to end here on this slide, but I will say in the end that actually I think um, this, this field of two-dimensional embeddings and visualization of complicated high-dimensional data by complicated, I mean data that have some maybe continuous submanifolds in it, but also cluster structures um, and maybe uh, cells during development, like you know, split into several evolutionary um, um, branches. Um, so there can be not only one dimensional manifolds but some kind of tree manifolds in the um, in the original data but there can also be clusters so that's what i mean by complicated data and embedding this complicated data into two dimensions faithfully is a very complicated problem that tsne uh, solves great but there definitely can be further improvements for example a very i think interesting question that we just see on this slide is that this embedding tells us something important about the data this embedding also tells us something important about the data can we somehow have the two things combined into one embedding um, that would show us both the continuous structure and the cluster structure and have some uh, white space in between large um, distinct areas um, and so on and so forth so i think this field is definitely will see more exciting developments in the in the years to come as more and more data sets also become available um, like this one uh, where where this can be applied to thank you